Enderall's like that one kid from everybody's art class. Sure, she got the same assignments and had to use the same materials, and she was even taught the same techniques as you, but she did it so much better than everyone else, and by comparison, your painting looks like you dipped your mushroom tip into some paint and smushed it against the canvas a few hundred times. You're Skyrim in this analogy, by the way. Here's the opening cutscene from Enderall. Now when you look at that, I totally forgot about them. They're dead, don't you remember? You murdered them back then, both of them. Bring me a nice crisp piece of meat! 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 What the fuck? Did you know that this is a mod for Skyrim? Yeah, a free fucking mod. You know what else is crazy? It's probably my favorite action RPG that's been released in about eh, a couple years. And I would have gladly paid 60 bucks for this shit. I mean, for fuck's sakes, look at this stuff. What's up? Um, well, that does sound like him. Here's a better analogy. You ever see those and one videos where the street baller goes up against the pro baller and ends up breaking a professional's ankles over and over again? Well, that's essentially what Enderall and the mod community have been doing to Bethesda for years. I'm not kidding you when I say that Enderall does nearly everything better than Skyrim. And not just better, but significantly different enough that it truly feels like an entirely different game, and thus experience from the original. That doesn't mean that the Skyrim engine doesn't bust down the door of your immersion every now and then to remind you that this was made on it. It reminds you every chance it gets. But Enderall puts in a good effort to minimize that engine's effects. This video is going to be a bit different than my other videos. We won't be going over the systems in exhausting detail and will be, instead, looking at this package as a whole. The changes, the design, and the gameplay, and if time allows, the story. But before we go any further, a disclaimer. First off, this mod runs like shit! I was consistently around 30 FPS, and occasionally dipped down into the low 20s. I believe this has to do with how the creation engine processes objects in the world. What I've noticed is that mods that make the world feel a little more lived in feature, by nature, a lot of clutter and objects. And that's one thing that this engine hates, it's objects. I have a fairly high-end machine, so I have no idea what the fuck is going on here, but every time I complain I remember that this is running on an engine from 2012 that was already old in 2002, and the result of that performance hit is one of the most beautiful looking first-person RPG worlds I've stepped into in a very long time. So yes, in short, the performance is not so much the fault of the mod, but the fault of the engine it's running on. This mod uses vanilla Skyrim's engine, which is then patched and modded into Enderall's package, with Sky UI packaged in with it. It also crashes, just like vanilla Skyrim, so at least it makes you feel like it's 2012 again, which is especially helpful if you're old like me and feeling your mortality. Oh no, I'm at it! Oh, do you hear that, Elizabeth? <laughs> I'm coming to join you, honey! I've seen tutorials to get this to run on Special Edition's engine, but I'm not doing that. Not in the time I have available for this, because this is a long ass game and daddy's gonna be pulling a lot of all-nighters. I've seen estimates that this game takes about 50 hours to complete. I believe it. So since this game has some different mechanics in Skyrim, we need to take a look at some of those changes. Now there's quite a few things you're gonna wanna do before you even start playing the game. Paramount of which are the graphical settings. The shadows in this game tank performance the hardest, so if you're having trouble maintaining your frames, you're going to want to bump that down. With a high-end machine, I even had to bump the setting down to low just to get a solid 50 FPS. Sometimes I even get 60. All tabbing out of the screen when you're in exclusive full screen mode crashes it, so you know how Bethesda are like, you know, uber geniuses when it comes to fucking keybinds? Well, the next thing you're going to want to do is unbind that alt key completely from any key. Not just the run key, but every key that it's attached to. Don't let it be attached to anything. And then you're going to want to rebind run to shift, or whatever key you're most comfortable with. 
because I can't tell you how many times I yelled Todd you motherfucker at the top of my lungs every time I was alt running away from something to open my inventory and chuck a potion. You also want to be playing this on full screen borderless so this kind of shit doesn't happen to you. Developers, listen, stay away from the alt key. It has no uses for you. Treat it like it isn't even a key on the keyboard, okay? Treat it like the Windows key. For fuck's sakes, don't use it. There are four races in Enderall, and no matter what, you're always half whatever the name of the race is. The Eterna are a swamp people with alien looking faces, and depending on what you pick in the character creator, funky looking reptile eyes, who look similar to Altmer. They have a natural affinity for magic and are guaranteed to be able to use magic. Although that chance is 100% regardless of what race you pick because video game. They get a starting bonus of 10 to mana, and they get a plus 2 to entropy and elementalism, and a plus 4 in enchanting. The Arazalians are like the steppe people of Eastern Europe, and are considered nomads. So while they're described as steppe people, they really are just like a bunch of Nords. So no ritual head binding to make your character look like Dan Aykroyd from Coneheads. We will go forth and live undetected on Earth amongst the blunt skulls. They get a plus 10 bonus to health and receive a plus 2 bonus to heavy armor skill and two-handed skills as well as plus 4 to handicraft. A Kalean character will enjoy a 10 point higher carrying capacity and a plus 4 bonus to rhetorics and sleight of hand, as well as a plus 2 to marksman. They remind me most of the Imperials and their backstory is even that of the exceptional businessman. The Kyraeans are a desert people who specialize in... Nah, fuck it. They're red guards. They get a plus 10 to stamina and a plus 2 bonus to one handed and light armor and plus a 4 to alchemy. Now those bonuses may seem underwhelming, but let me tell you, they aren't. They end up being in this weird state between good and mediocre because of the way Enderall has changed the leveling system and how skill levels work. Speaking of which, we really need to talk about these systems that have changed. Now if you've never heard of Skyrim, I have to ask, when did you wake up from your coma and have you shaven that massive beard yet? If you managed to avoid Skyrim like the spoilers of your favorite TV show, then check out my previous video. It'll help you understand what has changed and why that's significant. There are many changes from vanilla Skyrim to Enderall. The biggest and most important change is how leveling up your character works. This game has ditched the old level system and has decided to go with a straight up EXP based system. Skyrim used to have experience points, but you never saw them. Every time you met a condition when using a skill, that skill would gain some experience and eventually you would level up. Enderall got rid of all that and has opted to go with straight up EXP and I couldn't be happier for it. First off, each level feels hard won. There's not a whole lot of ways to exploit the system save for alchemy, which is honestly too broke from Skyrim's implementation to actually fix it completely, but they definitely tried. Now health potions increase your arcane fever, so you can't spam them. I mean, how many times does two go into 100? And then equal sign. 50. You can spam it 50 times. You won't do that, however, because Ambrosia, which is the shit that brings your fever down, is expensive as fuck. And it was very hard for me to find it, because it was pretty rare, too. And I think the alchemy ingredients are actually randomized every new play session, because I had another person playing it along with me, and they said they had different ingredients for Ambrosia. I mean, it's as if they had this, you know, really big concern about, like, balancing their economy. Can you fucking imagine that? It's almost as if they think that, like, one weak link in the entire chain fucks up the whole thing, you know? It's almost as if they really cared about the quality of every single system in the game. And because the game has such a well-balanced economy, it means that you're always going to be broke, and not for some cheap reason because they don't give you enough money or anything. It's because every time you get some money, you're going to be spending all of that on learning books to try and catch up on the whole damage curve. Because the main story of this game, it ramps. It ramps real hard, so you gotta catch up to it. We'll come back to that, but back to the arcane fever. Now, I've never let it get so high that it's ever really an effect on me. You get little minuses here and there at like certain levels of arcane fever, like I think 40%. It's not that harsh, and I'm not quite sure what happens when you get to 100, because the wiki says you can either die or turn into a monster. I guess that's what I need to do now, as my duties as a game analyst demand it. Because if I don't do it, what else will people get up to when they're taking a shit? 
They might start jacking off and nobody wants that. Let's see if we can turn into an Orbaya. And yes, I know it says in the UI that you can die. The logical part of my brain is already screaming at me to trust the UI, but I want to believe. The wiki says it's possible, and I want to live in a world where things like that are possible. Now, just a couple of potions left to brew, and we should be in Orbaya before we know- Looks like he just dropped dead. You gain EXP for doing things like discovering new areas, killing enemies, finding magic skulls, and picking locks. As a result, leveling up can take a while. I found myself excited at every level because I was one step closer to unlocking a skill I really wanted, all the while earning a chance to increase my favorite skills with learning points. That's another welcome change. The skill trees. They've been melded into what is essentially 11 trees broken up into 5 categories. Progression through these trees is mostly linear, but after a major skill or power upgrade, the trees open up to three choices, offering you the same kind of chance to focus down on a weapon or a magic type, like in Vanilla Skyrim. What makes these unique is the way the talents or powers change the way you play the game. I mean, they are essentially shouts, some of them, but some of the powers I don't really remember and feel like they might be custom, as well as some of the spells. Psionics and Entropy are my two favorite lines of magic. You can play as a Jedi with the psionic push, or you can cast green AoEs of sickness, or just plain steal someone's life force with the light magic line. Walking around with a sword in one hand while sucking the life out of someone feels pretty badass, I'm not gonna lie, and those abilities get stronger every time you level the skill up. At least, that's what I think works. It doesn't work like that for alchemy, but I feel like it works like that with damage. Here's, here's a rule of thumb. If you have a spell that says, for every two or three points in this so on skill, it will increase the damage. That's when you know it's gonna actually happen, and that's why I like the psionic school, because that's how it works. It gets pretty stupidly powerful. The only way to level up a skill is to use learning points and books that you find through exploring, or by from buying them from vendors. This puts a soft cap on how much you can increase a skill per level. I say soft cap because you can find or buy other books which increase your learning points and, in rare instances, find books that increase your memory points, which allow you to purchase perks from the various trees without leveling up. In this way, the game feels very deliberate, and difficult in a way, because if you're not on the lookout for books you need, you can find your power level getting outpaced by the main story very quickly. That's another change from Skyrim to Enderall, and that's that the game is really fucking hard, at least for me giving it a try for the first time. There are some really big differences from Skyrim that don't necessarily fit into any category, so I'll just talk about them here. Unlike Skyrim, the game has an idea of what it wants you to do, and the design of not just the systems but the world play into that. I'd say that if this mod reminded me of any game, it reminds me most of the Gothic series. Its level design is a lot like it too. Firstly, we have learning points, almost seemingly ripped right from Gothic. You're granted 10 learning points after every level, and those learning points grant you the ability to increase your skills by one point per book consumed. Just like in Gothic, your power is dictated by how many of those learning points you have and are able to consume, and because you'll mostly be buying these books, it depends heavily on how much money you have. It was common on all of my playthroughs to have a ton of learning points saved up because I couldn't afford to buy all the books I needed, or as is the case with psionics, couldn't find the fucking books I needed. It was also mostly the same way in Gothic as well, but due mostly to the fact that a trainer refused to train you, or you couldn't find the trainer you needed, or in some cases couldn't afford the training. I love this system as it keeps your character somewhat grounded in reality and makes you feel like every encounter early on is still somewhat dangerous and because the enemies don't scale to your level, there will be encounters you can't deal with at first, but by the end of the game, you end up just feeling like a fucking god, which is a great feeling to have in an RPG, especially when the work to get there was hard and rewarding. The level design is very deliberate as well. In Skyrim, the level design was very open in the middle and in the mountains is where you got all your little trails and everything, but in Enderal, the paths are what get you to places, and while you can traverse over mountains if you manage to platform jump your way over to the top, the game is sort of straddling you to certain areas that won't kill you. You still have the option of running off in any direction, but the game limits you with a soft hand and 
gently pushes you back to stay in the starting area until you've explored thoroughly and no longer fear combat encounters. And only once you are ready do you have to continue on. While Skyrim's approach to world design is to throw you into a huge wide open area, dot the landscape with waypoints and say, go in whatever direction tickles your taint. This game gives you winding roads, linear traversal with a layer of openness, and verticality, and it removes fast travel from the map so you have to use myrads or scrolls of teleportation to quickly move about. These travel methods are largely missing from the game until you get to Ark and it feels like the game has total faith in its storyline and really wants you to experience it. It combines the best handcrafted parts of a game like Gothic with the dizzying array of shit to do from a game like Skyrim. Talents replace shouts and racial powers, and many can be bought from the various skill trees, and again, this is another thing that has changed. In order to level up your character appropriately, you must go to meditate. While meditating, you will be brought to the island, and on this island are many standing stones which represent the skill trees. This is a much simpler way to handle what was done in Skyrim's trees, but represented in a much better and streamlined way that doesn't lose the depth of the previous iteration, but instead gets rid of things that weren't all that interesting, while simultaneously adding powers to the tree that fundamentally change how you play. I've played through the first 10 hours of the game with three different character builds. In the first iteration, I used an elementalist, and halfway up the tree, I was granted a power that's similar to a shout in that it sprayed out a cone of ice and froze opponents in place. It was a great skill for a character that was starting to, at this point, feel incredibly underpowered. My second character, was a heavy armor one-hander who used entropy and psionics. Unfortunately for this character, I found it very difficult to find learning books until I went into the underground and found the Shrouded Mage. And I don't think in the first three hours of gameplay I ever saw an entropy book. I went online and looked at the wiki to find out where these books were, and I found a forum post with someone asking the same thing as me, with the developer responding saying, We are aware of the problem and we'll fix it at some point. That post was dated a year ago. So anyway, overall, I really like the changes to the skill trees, but there are two unique systems that I didn't really get a chance to mess around with, Werewolf and Netta Souls. Netta Souls allows you to summon phantasms that act as programmable sidekicks, I think? It's like having a permanent see-through ghost buddy to haunt your enemies and tank your damage for you. With Lycanthropy, you can brew potions and those potions give you access to your wolf powers like shock imbued claws and so on. It's less a werewolf thing and more like a Jekyll Hyde kind of thing where Hyde is actually a werewolf. Yeah, that makes sense. Sounds good on paper, but I didn't get a chance to try it out in the week and a half I played it for. And now a word from our sponsor. In a world. So let me get this straight. Yes. Where anything is possible. You're telling me that there's an infinite number of universes and possibilities out there? Indeed. There's even a universe where you slay even more puss than you do now. There's also a universe where you are a skinny rapper named Earl Simmons. He's been in prison for several years. A man who has it all is about to discover. Well, is he? Is he at least slaying it? No. I'm afraid he's the one getting slayed. That sometimes slaying puss isn't fun. This will not stand! If your alter dimensional brothers can't have none. Y'all putting together a team. Can I count on you? Well, what's the job? I'm glad you asked, pussy slayer from the planet of the snooty people. You're gonna break me out of prison. Cocaine is a hell of a drug. Man, you need to nut up, motherfucker. It's the blockbuster event of the decade. From Pussy Slayer Productions, it's Pussy Slayer 3D. Coming soon. The talent system is where this game really diverts from Skyrim. Some of these talents are simply reskins, as I said before, of shouts and some powers. But some of them are powers I've not seen in Vanilla Skyrim, so forgive me if these are in Vanilla Skyrim. I've never 100%ed that game, so I don't know. Talents come from the Standing Stones in your meditative safe place, and each branch of the skill trees has at least two talents which roughly coincide with a playstyle. Because of the limitations in Skyrim's engines, a lot of these skills do not work as intended. For instance, Starling Dummy says that when it's close enough to an enemy, it explodes, which is supposed to paralyze enemies according to the wiki, but in-game it says that it makes them prone to damage. 
So the wiki's wrong on that account, and the spider seems to work as it's described in-game, but for skills that are supposed to stagger enemies, what you'll find is that Skyrim's engine gets in the way of that functionality. See, if an enemy is in the midst of an animation, chances are a stagger won't work. So if an enemy is committed to a power attack, the stagger will only work if the character's in the beginning of that animation or at the tail end of it. For some reason, the middle of the animation seems to be the dead zone, where the animation cannot be interrupted. Another place this comes up is if the enemy is already staggered and getting up. You can't use your skill to reset the stagger. The enemy simply ignores it and begins shredding your face with a straight razor. So skills that supposedly stagger an opponent are risky because, depending on the situation, they're inconsistent. And without consistency, the player can't depend on a skill like they would normally. The other thing about this system that was once again inherited from Skyrim is the talents. You use the key that's normally bound to the shout key, and in this mod, there are times when, for instance, you use spells with shouts. When you hit the Z key, nothing happens. The shouts will fail to go off until you sheathe your weapon and try the skill again. It happens constantly for me, and it makes using the skills in the midst of combat dangerous and usually ends with you dead. The problem is, you're supposed to use some of those skills constantly, so having it constantly not work is kind of shitty. I've only seen it happen with one character though, and that's my one-handed psionicist. For a great example of this, I built a heavy armor psionic one-hander who uses Devour Soul to get tanky against groups of enemies. As a result, I end up kiting enemies when I'm low on health and use Devour Soul on the first dead body I come across. And with 30% absorption that scales the enemy's stats, if you use this on a high health enemy, you could basically refill your health. It sounds great, but the problem is that because I use Psionics in my left hand, sometimes I'm queuing up the spell as I'm queuing up the talent, and this locks up the shout key and sometimes keeps it from going off, so I basically sit there, spamming the Z key, hoping it'll go off eventually. I either die at that point, or kite the enemy long enough to sheathe my weapon and try again. It fucking sucks! And what's worse is if this game had its own engine designed to do this kind of thing specifically, it would have been a hell of a lot better. This mod shows just how unresponsive Skyrim is to player inputs. Think about this, Enderall wants you to use skills together. So let's take the snake tongue oil talent with fire arrows. What you need to make these two skills work together is bind each talent to a shortcut key, then press the shortcut key, then the Z key to use the power. Then hit the shortcut key for your follow-up fire arrows, hit the Z key again, then fire your arrows. Now, unless you're a Korean, I don't see how the hell you could pull this off flawlessly for each encounter! But if we take reflexes out of the equation by simply tying these inputs to a macro on the mouse, there's another more important problem. That's the issue that Skyrim's engine doesn't let you know what shout or talent you have equipped at any given time. So while you might be able to use snake tongue oil flawlessly, I've seen times where I've hit the key to change to fire arrows only to have it not work. I go into the quick select menu and find out that it isn't equipped, and by that point the enemy is already on top of me. I think that this is due to Skyrim not detecting inputs when another input is in use, or maybe it's just about the powers, but I can't really be sure. What I do know is that it doesn't work as expected, and I don't believe that it's this mod's fault. Having said that, the talent system has some pretty incredible skills, which I will go over here. The first talent that I want to look at is Archaic Might. This is a lot like Shock Nova in that you generate an AoE on you that staggers and shreds the enemy's health. I've seen where the stagger doesn't work consistently, so beware of that. It isn't a reliable way to interrupt an enemy in the middle of a power attack, apparently. Assassination allows you to move silently and boost your critical chance by 7% at max tier. This is good for situations where you've been discovered because you have that 7% extra crit chance and anything else that you've been stacking with gear, it'll just melt their health bar, whittling down the chances that you might die in that encounter. Devour Soul is a must pick for me because it allows me to keep moving forward without having to heal or wait up for stamina and mana to regen. What it does is allow you to consume a corpse mana and health and stamina, up to 30% at the highest tier of the enemy stats. That means the bigger the enemy, the bigger the benefit. They also explode at the end of the effect for a pretty good amount of damage, and I believe it also staggers, though I've never stuck around long enough to find that out. Dimensional Rift is so powerful that I don't know how I've lived my whole life without it. At max tier, it holds the enemy in place, making them immune from damage while sapping away their mana and stamina and giving it to you. When they come out of stasis, they take damage equal to the total you absorb. So what happens here is you use this skill on an enemy who is either dangerous or annoying. 
deal with his friends and while that's happening, you are constantly gaining back big chunks of your stamina and mana. Once they come out of stasis, they're most likely dead, and the minute they die, you devour their soul to gain back whatever life you've lost and watch the body explode all the enemies around it. If they don't die, they collapse to the ground, allowing you to mash their faces. Ooh, right down brown town. It's my favorite talent. No, not that, the, uh, the other thing. Entropic Blood is a neat little talent. It allows you to slow down time, then pick an enemy you want to enslave. The slave will attack the first enemy it finds, and if it dies in the middle of this, it'll explode. You can get a double explosion if you use Devour Soul on the dying enemy right before the initial explosion. It's super sexy shit. I'm sure that Flash Powder has its uses, but I couldn't be bothered with it. Firstly, why can't I attack an enemy I flash banged? That's sort of like the whole point of the item. Instead, Flash Powder staggers the enemy for a significant amount of time, which allows you to run away and hide. It works consistently, which is why it's here, but the fact that it makes enemies invulnerable is the reason I will never use it. There's just too many better skills out there to do similar things while doing significant damage. But if you're the type that likes to clear areas with stealth kills, well, this is the skill for you, you fucking perfectionist. It's also really good for crowd control and getting out of bad situations. Shock Nova is stupidly fucking powerful. The initial AoE does pretty good damage and seems to stagger consistently, and then the follow-up Lightning Bolt usually kills low-tier enemies and will have the health of medium-tier enemies. It's a great crowd controller and damaging spell. Snake Tongue Oil is great when used together with fire of any sort, be that fire arrows or just a fire spell. I've also seen this skill make enemies affected by it fall down. The vulnerability poison it applies is also pretty nasty and results in one or two shotting low and mid-tier enemies. There's a ton more builds out there that I wasn't able to cover or test out, and I'm sure every one of these skills has uses. If you found some use that I didn't cover here, or you have some interesting builds you want to share, you know, share it in the comments below. This game does exposition right. Normally in games where a character I just met starts talking about themselves, I just roll my fucking eyes so far in the back of my head that I can actually see the lack of electrical signals in my brain as the part that handles concentration goes to sleep. These kinds of scenes remind me of a first year college student's Tumblr page. I don't care about the girlfriend that cheated on you or the dad that never loved you. I just came here for the animated gifts of Tiffa's tits, okay? And her all keeps all the goods until later in the game and for good reason, Jespar. Jespar is the best boy in this regard. He keeps all of his personal stuff to himself until you get to ride the choo-choo train together. See, the effect of how he's written was felt by me in a way that I felt it necessary to talk about it because it struck me as a fine example of what companion writing is supposed to be. The first time you meet this guy, he saved you from imminent death by fire arrow, and he seems more concerned about who you are, why you were there, where he found you, and the, the nature of your fever. He's a, he's a mercenary hired by a magister in the Sun Temple, but he doesn't reveal that part of who he is at first. After our first conversation, I was feeling a little suspicious of him because who the hell appears out of nowhere like that in a video game without having some ulterior motive? I mean, seriously, it's a fucking trope at this point. He was also consistently going out on missions with me, but he never stuck around after. He, you know, he went off and did his own thing. Because that's what people fucking do. Nothing gets more annoying than a companion in an RPG who has no life and constantly wants to talk about it. I mean... Even too much of Eva Green can be annoying if she doesn't leave eventually to take a shower. Because of this, I kept waiting for him to betray me. But that suspicion drove me to know more about him, and as a result, he didn't dump exposition about himself on my lap. He told me things as he felt comfortable to do so, and in a weird way, the game captured what it's like to get to know someone new and slowly over time, get close to them. And that's a sort of analogy of the world building of Enderall and how it's handled. If you're like me, you don't bother reading the books in the game until later, maybe midway through when you're bored and want to learn a little more about a specific topic. That's why I love in-game codexes when they're used correctly, because if I'm unsure of how a specific thing works in the game world, I'll hit up the codex. And sometimes I learn a little lore, which makes me look up topics related to it, and the next thing you know I'm in a rabbit hole, learning everything I can about the game world. In Skyrim, this was handled by individual books, which is time-consuming to say the least if you're trying to find info on a particular topic. It can make it a little nice, exciting, fun adventure to find a book on a certain topic, but it also can be tedious as fuck. 
Enderall doesn't lean heavily on books. It introduces you to what makes the game special in digestible chunks, and in doing so, manages to perfectly foreshadow what's to come later. I'm honestly not sure I can pull this off, but I want to try and tell you about the story without spoiling it. Now, I may not be able to succeed at that, so I'm giving you fair warning, so put your dick skinners on the desk and listen to what I'm saying. If you don't want anything spoiled, just leave the video now. Play the game, pop back in, and tell me all about it, okay? Five, four, three, two, one! Okay, now that he's gone, <laughs> what an asshole, am I right? Anyway, continuing on. I will use one spoiler, and that is in your role as a prophet. I think that this is the story twist that had the least impact on me because you're having visions the whole time and foreseeing events before they happen. This by itself makes my uh, inner spider senses tingle. Now, as a prophet, you're seeing the possibilities in a range of alternative timelines or pasts and futures. As such, you're instrumental to the plans of an empire. Or at least that's how it seems at first, until you realize a Mass Effect-like truth. And there are ripples of Mass Effect's tone and plot points throughout the game. Not that that's a bad thing, it's not. But the inspirations are there and I thought I'd mention it. There's also a triad structure of conflict, which is how I frame most of my stories. Since we're talking about Mass Effect, their structure was Shepard on the corner, the Council at the top, and the Reapers on the other side. Each faction wants to maintain its power in space society as a whole. But while the Alliance can either want a more powerful human presence or just equality, depending on your choices. The Reapers want to take power over the galaxy by wiping everyone out. Each character believes that what they're doing is right, and each one has to fight to get what they want, which means that they naturally come into conflict with one another. You see a similar effect in Enderal, except it goes a layer deeper in its conflict. On one side of this conflict is the Order. They claim to want to save humanity by hiding the death of their self-proclaimed gods. Think of Morrowind and you'll get the idea. The truth is that they want to save humanity from a threat that's coming, so they need you because of your gift of sight. And this is another thing we need to talk about. They give you a reason why you're the only person who can help them. You see the meanings behind things that were used in times when an entire civilization just vanished, and left very little in the way of records. So you are, at times, the only person who can figure things out. At least, that's what the game tells you. But there's no real investigative structure in this game, unfortunately. I was sad to see that. You don't go on these missions because you figure out how to construct the MacGuffin. Someone else figures that out. You're just the errand boy. But the reason this works is because you're the only one in the dungeon who has future sight and past sight. So you can see which way, for instance, the bells are supposed to be rung in this cavern while nobody else can. So the Order needs you to help them stop the coming event that will spray raid brooch spray over an entire civilization. The direct antagonist to them is a threat that doesn't show its face until later in the game. The continent has been invaded by Narum forces. And this is not a surprise to you because Theodore told you that each event is preceded by a catastrophic war. The man making this war happen is doing it because he wants to have humanity sprayed with Raid Roach Spray because he believes it will help him evolve into a Charizard. On the third end of this pyramid is another more indirect antagonist that only shows its face to you. They are red glowy things that I won't go into much detail on here, but they want the same thing as the crazy Narum dude. But they are enemies to everyone, using one to destroy the other. Each faction in this war believes that they're doing what is right, and each has plausible reasons for doing what they're doing. And they're all trying to convince you that they are right. The problem is, the third faction, the Red Glowy Men, could be manipulating either group. So you go through the entire game feeling like, are my friends fucking me here? Do they actually know what we're supposed to do, or are they being manipulated too? And if this description of the plot doesn't make you want to go out and play this fucking game right now, then I don't know what can! Now I'm glad I followed through on this recommendation from the community. I got a ton of comments about Enderall after the Skyrim video premiered, so... I decided to check it out, and I'm glad I did. If this video does as well as the Skyrim video did, I'll finish up the script on the main story for Enderall. Please share the video. And now that YouTube is my full-time gig, these videos have been coming out bi-weekly consistently, so I want to thank all the new people that have shown up, and to the old folk who've been around since the beginning. Talking to you people in the comments, it's like sitting on the porch enjoying a nice cold glass of tea and talking about your younger years. Also, if you've stuck around this long, go check out my Patreon. Let me tell you why you should donate. <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me put on my marketing hat right quick. 
So, with these videos coming out bi-weekly, I am sometimes forced to cut content that I can't get out on time. The algorithm pushes hard for me to keep on a, you know, bi-weekly schedule so that I can get out of all algo jail and stay out of it. So now that I'm out of it, I definitely want to stay out. But Patreon helps me become less reliant on ads for revenue, which means I can put more time into each video and release them on a far less rigid schedule. We're talking about longer, more in-depth conversations about each system. For you, the reward of doing that is that you get different tiers and you'll be able to vote on what video I look at next, have your questions answered in the credits of the video. I put the question of which video I'll be tackling next to the Patreons last week, and it was a two-way tie at the time of closing. It has since changed, but uh, when I tallied up the, uh, <laughs> the scores, it was a tie. The Fallout series and the Shadowrun series will be next, starting with Fallout, then we'll be looking at the console versions of Shadowrun, then we'll go back to Fallout 2, and so on. We'll just go back and forth. It should be fun. So anyway, thanks for coming by. Uh, thanks for listening to my fucking ad. <laughs> and, uh... You know, stay safe out there. Peace.